Speaking of suffering, Paul said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And I like that, in us. It's not somewhere far away, but in us. And we can be a part of that great revelation. I sense a heaviness here this morning. And um, perhaps you can, I can identify, well, I can identify with some of you that came this morning and you said, I don't know what to say. It's kind of bad when you stand behind a pulpit and have that kind of a feeling. I've been preaching for 40 years, but this is one of those times that I'll stand before. I'll never forget this sermon. We preach sermons that we don't remember. The Bible says, heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop. There's been a lot of stooping this week. There's been a lot of heaviness this week. But I'm so glad for the rest of that verse, which says, heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. Folks, we have the good word in hand. That is the word of God. And the Bible says, wherefore comfort ye one another with these words. What words is it talking about? Not our words, but the word of God. And so we have so much in our favor. God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah when he said, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Have you felt the hand of God drawing you this week? I, I, I'm overwhelmed with the love and the grace and the affection that this church has showed for their pastor and his family this week. God will bless you for that. And he certainly is blessing your pastor's family because of that. I think of what God said also to Jeremiah. He said, for I know the thoughts that are think towards you. And I think that, well, I know that was uh, spoken to a people that were going into captivity. And they were sad. Everybody's heart was broken. But God says, I know the thoughts that are think towards you, saith the Lord. To give you an expected end. In other words, it's going to be all right in the end. In the end. And there will be an end of our suffering. There will be an end to the brokenness, to the broken hearts. When we bring our hearts to the Lord, let's just bring all the broken parts and he's got a way of putting things together. I don't want to overly mourn that Molly died. Rather, I want to thank God and rejoice that Molly lived, and that she continues to live. We, the family, have a choice. We can be grateful to God for the gift of Molly's life. For 16 years, we have enjoyed her presence. And though she was little of stature, and she had not many words. She made a powerful impression on those that loved her and knew her. And so we can rejoice in that or we can grieve in hopelessness because she has been taken away from us. Yes, she has been taken away. But in Job's great grief, in the loss of his family, he lost all of his family. And he said, in other words, Job tro chose the attitude of gratitude when he said, the Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. And then catch this, blessed be the name of the Lord. It's a wonderful thing. And this is what pastor is doing with his family, showing them we want to keep blessing God. We want to keep praising God. In other words, Job had a conviction that the grave is not the end. It was Job who said, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job is still waiting. Been waiting for 
3,500 years, Molly would not have to wait that long for her new body because we know the Lord is coming back. And so, de- uh, let's, let's face it, folks. Death is a pernicious enemy that often strikes without warning and is irrespective, irrespective of, the, of the pain and the broken hearts it leaves in its wake. But a wise poet penned words like this. He said, death leaves heartaches that man cannot heal, but love leaves memories that even death cannot steal. I appreciate the memories that we that Molly has left, and many of your lives have been touched with it. And so, even though you're here and don't know what to say, the very pre- fact that you are here means a tremendous lot. I'll guarantee you, in years to come, the family will remember who has been here for the funeral, who took time off, who took a day off just to be here. So, the wise preacher in the book of Proverbs speaks of the power of the comfort and the healing of good memories of the departed loved ones. In Proverbs chapter 10, he says, the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. I really appreciate Molly's testimony in life. After she left, there was a book, a journal found. It was her prayer journal. I did not know that she had such a close walk with God. She just changed addresses here last week. Now let's do our best, my friends, to keep Molly's memories sharp. Let's keep them bright. And above all, let's keep her memories alive. In other words, we'll talk about her likes and her dislikes, especially when holidays come along. That's when these departed loved ones are missed the most. But we'll remember the things and we'll repeat the things that she said. We'll laugh about the things that she laughed at. We'll cry about the things that she cried about. And folks, you won't offend her by lightheartedly mentioning a few quirks that she had. You mean she had quirks? All teenagers have, you know that. But it's to her honor for us to shed tears for her. Never be ashamed of shedding tears. I wonder if... King David, when he was reminiscing about the good old days, perhaps he was thinking about the departed loved ones when he said, I remember the days of old. I meditate upon all thy works. I muse upon the work of thy hands. He looked back in his life and he saw how God used circumstances, even bad circumstances, how God used his friends Because it was David who said, I'm a companion of all them that fear God and of them that keep thy precepts. I believe that was after David had yoked up with people he should not have yoked up with and he made some wrong choices. And then he made a decision. I'm going to be with people that do right. And I was so glad to see that Molly's best friends were Christians, real believers. And so... David knew all about the grief and the sorrows of losing a child. Uh, When his baby boy was so sick, he was sick unto death. It so broke his heart that he ceased doing his kingly duties. He pretty much stayed in bed. He was sorrowing and grieving so deeply. And when the child died, they were afraid to tell him. They was afraid they would, he would completely lose it now. But to their surprise, 
He got up, got up out of bed, changed his clothes. That was after he saw them whispering. He said, is the child dead? They said, the child is dead. And so he got up to their utter surprise and washed up, dried up his tears, and asked for food. He had been eaten. He'd been fasting. Now, why did he do this? They were shocked to see the change. But why did he do this? It was like Job, he believed in the future resurrection. How do I know this? Because of the words that he said. He said, referring to the baby, he cannot come to me, but I shall go to him. Amen. Folks, that's, that's from a living hope that Pastor Forsberg preached about this morning. We have a living hope. And so here's a sure fact. We cannot have Molly back as we knew her. That causes pain and tears. But if you have repented of your sins, if you have called upon the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have trusted him as your Savior, if you have been born again, as Jesus said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no other way. No matter how good you live. By the way, um, Molly is not in heaven because of how good she lived. She's in heaven because she trusted her Savior who had perfect righteousness and who then gave her perfect righteousness. So going to heaven means that we will meet again if we are born again and saved, if our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So never be ashamed of having a broken heart because the Bible says the Lord is nigh unto them that have a broken heart. And I must think this morning God is near to a lot of us in here because of the broken hearts that are here this morning. He said in Psalms 51, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O Lord, thou wilt not despise. And so God has given a special attention to these broken hearts. Did you know at Lazarus' graveside, the Bible says that Jesus wept? Think about that for a moment. Why did Jesus weep? Was it because he was sad? Was it because he lacked power? Was it because he was unhappy? I say none of these. No, it's because the people wept. And Jesus had empathy for the people. What does empathy mean? There's a difference between empathy and sympathy. You could say empathy is sympathy in shoe leather. I, I saw so much of that in the short time we were here. People came, not only brought food to the house, not only dropped cards off of cards of sympathy, but you opened your arms. and cried with the parents, with the siblings. Tears flowed from your eyes. It was not your daughter. It was not your kin. It was because you had empathy. That's a good thing to have. Jesus wept because the people wept. I'm so glad that we have a verse in the Bible that says we have not a high priest, who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. I don't care what your feelings are today, how broken you are, Jesus experienced the same thing. Amen. Mary and Martha, they were so sad that Jesus was two days late. In fact, they had sent him word he could have been there in time, and they knew it. He could have been there in time. And so they said, Lazarus, our brother, would not have died if you'd have come sooner. In other words, they were saying, Jesus, you were late. How many of you thought you've had times in your life when Jesus showed up too late? 
Let me tell you, assure you this morning, Jesus is never late. He's always on time. Now, we know the rest of the story of how Jesus raised Lazarus, and we know that he was not too late. This was all intentional. Uh, Jesus could have said, when he saw them weeping, he could, have, he could have snickered. He could have chuckled. He could have laughed. He said, wait till they see what I've got to show them. And yet, he wept. I believe Jesus weeps with us today. Here's a question. A few days later, after Jesus gloriously raised Lazarus from the dead, would those loved ones still want it their way? Or would they now say, I'm, Lord, I'm so glad you took your way. I believe the day is coming when we will understand fully Jesus does all things well, all the time, with everybody. They wanted restoration. Jesus gave them resurrection. What a difference. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Did you catch that? The power that worketh in us? That's available to us. He wants us to experience that. What they wanted was vastly inferior to what Jesus gave them. So, there's so much more, I believe, that God's people have yet to experience. So much better things. Jesus said, I'm come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. What do you think it means when he says, I hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither hath it entered the heart of any man what God has prepared for them that love him. Folks, we have a house full of people here that love the Lord. And I'm excited to think that God's got some things he's about to reveal to you. To an inheritance that is uncorruptible, undefiled, that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Looking back over my 70 years, I'm so glad that God didn't give me what I asked for back then. But God gave me far better, far better than what anything I could have comprehended. And so I can truly say with the psalmist, this is the Lord's doings. It is marvelous in our eyes. I look back and I marvel at what God did in my life. Thou wilt show me the path of life, the psalmist said. Thou wilt show me the path of life. And so much good which comes from walking the path of life. Generally, most obituaries have a long list of people who preceded them in death. Molly's obituary will be very unique in that not one person in her family is listed as preceding her in death. <gasps> She's the first one. Well, in so many things in life, being the first one is something special. I don't have to tell you that Molly was very special. She's the very first one in her family to pass from this life to glory. A life, here's the saying, a life that is lived is like a tale that is told. Not how long it is is what matters, but how good it is. I think that Molly in her 16 years experienced more of the goodness and the closeness of her Savior than many people experience that grow to be old in years. Abraham Lincoln put it in these words. He, he said, in the end, it's not the years in life that count, but it's the life in the years that count. For us who are born again, the grave is not the end. That's what Paul was talking about when he said, oh, death, where is thy sting? 
Oh, grave, where is thy victory? But thanks be to God who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's talking about victory over the grave. Yes, we will gather around her grave. We will do what millions have done before us. We will tearfully say our goodbyes. But for us, we have a living hope. One day, the busiest, the busiest place in this world will be in the graveyards of this world at the glorious time of the resurrection. And so Jesus said, marvel not at this. At what? At this. The hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. It's going to happen. This body of mine, little old crippled body, I thank God for this little crippled body because it's my only ticket to live in this wonderful world that Christ has created. The Lord's the creator of all these beautiful things. But with this body come subject to disease. I'm proof of that. And uh, so I, I'm looking forward to what, what Paul said, for we know when this earthly house of this tabernacle. A tabernacle is a tent, something that's temporary. He said this body is just temporary. For we know when that if our house of this tabernacle were destroyed, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Folks, that's something to shout about and to rejoice in that. The Bible for believers says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I ask another question before I close. Will there be tears in heaven? I think so. Here's why. I think so, but I believe it will be very brief. And this is because of a verse in Revelation. It says, For God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I wonder if Molly might have had some tears because she loved her parents, she loved her siblings, and she loved her best friends. By the way, her best friends are here. That's a good place to make friends, is in the house of God. I wonder if she might have cried because she was sad in the party. But the Bible says God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Uh-huh. And there shall be no more deaths, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. That would have been a comfort to her to hear that, uh-huh, mom and dad are coming too. Your siblings are coming too. Your friends, the ones who know the Lord, will be coming too. By the way, I know for a fact that she witnessed to her, co to her co-workers. Why? Because she loved them enough that she wanted to be with them for all eternity. Folks, when somebody witnesses to you, it's a good thing. It means they really care about you. But I said one more question. That means I got one more. <laughs> Has it ever occurred to you that our Heavenly Father also experienced separation from his beloved son, his only son? Yes. The Bible says that Jesus suffered death so we can have life. He died that we might live. The Bible says, For God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Yes. That's why Jesus said on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For a moment of time, there was a separation between God the Father and God the Son because of our sin being placed on him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, I pray that everybody here would make sure that your faith has been placed in God for your salvation, placed in the price that Jesus paid. 
Listen, there are many, many religious folks today that are going to church in some liberal outfit where the preacher gets up and pats them on the back, says some things that makes them feel good. What he's actually doing is making them feel comfortable on their way to hell. That's a sad thing. The Bible says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgressions, and the house of Jacob their sin. God wants us to see that so that we would turn to Christ. And it's a good thing for us to be made aware of that so we can repent and turn to Christ. I'm so glad that I can say to you that whosoever means you. And if you're not saved today, oh, would you trust Christ as your Savior? By the way, you could make, <laughs> you could make Molly happy by coming to Jesus. You say, why do you say that, preacher? Because the Bible says, likewise, there will be joy in heaven, Brother Corey, over one sinner that repenteth. It just may be that the saints in heaven will see it when they're friends or when somebody gets saved. And there is joy in heaven over one sinner that gets saved. So this ugly situation, this ugly thing called death that has intervened and interrupted our lives could be turned to a blessing. Just like God, the Bible says, the Lord had turned the curse into a blessing back in Numbers, book of Numbers. And so I just want to say today that let's take this time of seriousness and really, really examine our hearts as to where we stand. You see, I was religious for almost 30 years of my life, very religious, but nobody ever had shown me from the Word of God how I can know for sure that I'm going to heaven when I die. Let's make sure of that today. So right now, can we bow our heads for prayer time and pray in closing this service? The Bible has some beautiful invitations. In fact, they're the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Hey, that's us today. And I will give you rest. And you shall find rest for your souls. It was Jesus who said, Behold, I stand at the door, the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door. Folks, it's our responsibility to open the door. The Bible says, Draw an eye to God and he will draw an eye to you. God wants us to take that first step. The invitation has been given, but will we respond to it? If you don't know for sure, oh, let's make sure today before the sun sets. Because you know, our schedule could be so quickly changed, just as it has last week. So un the unexpected could happen. And once we pass from this life to the next, there are no second chances. The Spirit and the Bride saith, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And whosoever that is a thirst, let him come. Let him drink the water of life freely. It's an invitation. That's in the last chapter of the Bible. So the Bible closes with an invitation. I want Pastor to come and take it from here.